Okay, so I'm trying to resume. So I, I thought I'd run over what we were doing last time. Um, so uh, I need oh, I need a slideshow, don't I? Okay, so um, I was talking about the landau gen theory, which is based on a, a probability measure, uh, so, so it depends on X, uh, which gives the probability of finding a, a particular molecule drawn from a very small ball around X, but nevertheless containing huge numbers of molecules um, with a particular orientation, and that gives you a symmetric probability measure on, on the sphere. Uh, and um, so I so this, uh, this usually we're going to assume that it's a continuous measure, but, um, but, but singular ones are also uh, Im Im important. Um, there's the isotropic uh, um, phase. And, uh, and then we looked at the moments. The, the first moment of, of rho is zero by, um, by the symmetry of, of rho. And then um, the second moment uh, is, an, is a strictly positive symmetric tensor. So there's the second moment. And then uh, in order to, uh, and it has trace one, uh, and the, the, the second moment is one third the identity for the isotropic state. And so the Degen Q tensor, which is the basic variable, is the difference between those two things. So it's, it's this expression, which is, um, which is a symmetric trace-free matrix, which is, as a matrix, as a symmetric matrix, strictly bigger than minus a third the identity. And then we looked at the eigenvalues of the matrix uh, Q, um, and uh, we arranged them in order. So, and the minimum one is strictly bigger than minus a third, and the maximum one is strictly less than two thirds. And we showed that you could um, uh, if those those conditions are held, then um, uh, you could construct a, a row with those particular eigenvalues. Then I got stuck on this point, and now I see that I was being very stupid. Um, okay, so it was just to prove that Q squared was less than two thirds. Okay, so and I proved that lambda mid squared is less than lambda min squared. So this is less than two lambda min squared. Now lambda min is negative. And it's, so its, it's square is less than one ninth. And uh, lambda max is positive, and it's less than two thirds. And so that automatically gives you that. Sorry, I screwed that up last time. And then the limiting cases correspond to singular measures. Um, uh, OK, and then we gave conditions on Q for it to be uniaxial. So uniaxial ones, I'm missing, let me go back and remind you what. So these are the uniaxial uh, Q, the ones with two eigenvalues the same. Right? And then you can write them in this form where S is between minus a half and one. Uh, and so we, um, we gave necessary and sufficient conditions on Q um, for, um, uh, for it to be uniaxial with uh, such a scalar order parameter. And then we talked about the landau degen theory, uh, for which the energy is given by, well, the, the free energy density depends on Q and the spatial gradient of Q. And then we showed that, uh, well, frame indifference and uh, material symmetry impose some conditions. And so, um, and, and, and we split um, a C up into two pieces, the bulk energy, where we put the gradient equals zero and uh, the difference between the original of C and when you put grain equal to zero, and that's the bulk plus elastic energy. And so uh, the, the, the bulk energy has to be isotropic, so satisfy this, this uh, condition here. And, um, and uh, um, they have to depend on the three invariants of, or these, you can choose them to be these three invariants of Q. And uh, what else? Um, and so, um, since the 
the trace of q is zero. In fact, um, the, the bulk energy has to be a function of the trace of q squared and the trace of q cubed. Uh, and and then, we, then we looked at this particular a very popular quartic form for CB. So uh, the sum of, uh, well, it's, this is the, the, the most general uh, quartic form that's isotropic uh, with coefficients which we assume B was positive and C was positive and uh, A was uh, linear in the temperature. And then we showed that um, uh, the critical points have two equal eigenvalues so they're uniaxial and so uh, what, what, um, what this for this model we, we see that just looking at the bulk energy uh, it, it predicts a phase transformation from an isotropic fluid to a uniaxial pneumatic phase at, at a particular critical temperature given to you by uh, the, the constants in the, in the energy form and then the, if, you're, if the temperature is less than that critical temperature then this is the um, uh, uniaxial form and you're given what the order parameter is in terms of the a, b and c. And then we talked about the form of the elastic energy and uh, wrote down four invariants i1, i2 and i3 uh, and the first three uh, span possible isotropic quadratic functions of the gradient of q and then we've made a special choice here of one of six possible other um, cubic terms that are quadratic in the gradient of Q. We noted that I2 minus I3 was an old Lagrangian. Um, uh, if we wanted to deal with uh, um, cholesterics, which are hemitropic but not isotropic, we, we can consider this variant. And in general, we'll suppose that the elastic energy is a linear combination of those um, invariants. So that's the uh, sort of the summary of uh, what we assume in the landau de Gen, uh, theory. And then we talked about the constraint theory, which in fact we talked about in the first lecture, uh, but we didn't approach it this way. So, so for small elastic constants, it's reasonable to require Q to be uniaxial with a constant scalar order parameter. And then you just have to minimize the elastic energy subject to this, to this uh, constraint. And, um, uh, when you do that, you uh, you just shove um, the the, um, the uniaxial form into the um, uh, elastic energy, and you get the ozane frank energy that we discussed in the first um, lectures. Right, so that's where we were last time, and now I want to talk about existence in the landau de Gen theory. And so here's a theorem proved by Davis and Gartland. Um, so we suppose that omega is a bounded domain with Lipschitz boundary. We'll suppose that the, that the bulk energy is continuous and bounded below, and that L4 and L5 are zero. Okay, so L5 being zero means we're dealing with pneumatics, and um, L4, uh, L4 equals zero is, well, L4 equals zero, we're dropping, <laughs> we're dropping that term. And then there's some inequalities on L1, L2, and L3. And then you take some boundary data, which are the boundary values of some W12 uh, function, with, um, which is symmetric and trace-free. And here's the energy then, which we were discussing. And it, and it attains a minimum subject to those boundary values. Well, this is, um, apart from these inequalities, this is a kind of trivial matter. Um, so you, you, you take a minimizing sequence. Uh, and now this is, this is the point about the inequalities. So there's a calculation that shows that under those inequalities, the, the sum of the three elastic terms is bounded below by a, a positive constant times the gradient of Q squared. And in particular, that means it, it, it's convex, right? because the quadratic things that are non-negative are, are convex. So by the Poincare inequality, you can suppose that QJ is bounded in W12, so that we can, we can extract um, a weakly convergent uh, uh, subsequence to some Q star. And the Q star is in the admissible set because of the usual sort of trace theorems you can pass to the limit on the, on the boundary. And you can, al you can also assume by the compactness of the embedding from W12 to L2 that 
qj tends to q almost everywhere. And therefore, you've got, you've got two pieces to the energy, one in which you can use Fatou's lemma, which is the, the bulk energy. So you, you just use Fatou's lemma using point-wise convergence. And the other one, you use convexity. So convex uh, integrals are, are weakly low, semi-continuous. And so therefore, you get that, um, that Q star is a, is a minimizer. So it's a, it's a really straightforward um, uh, application of the direct method. The only difficult thing is those inequalities, which were proved actually by uh, Longer and, uh, and Trevin. OK, and in the Cortic case, you can use elliptic regularity to show that any minimizer is smooth. I mean, it's not, not uh, difficult to see that. I mean. There's the, there's the energy. I mean, it's a, this term will give you an elliptic operator. And this term is, is bounded. For Q, well, it, this, the, the, this, this term you can, uh, you can, you can handle um, by bootstrapping or something. Anyway, the, 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 so the minimizer, any minimizer is smooth. But what about this funny condition that L4 is 0? What's going on there? Okay, so what happens if L4 is not zero? Well, then, this is joint work with the Parler Majumda. Then the energy is, in fact, unbounded below. Okay, so we certainly can't minimize it. So, so why is that? And, and, and it doesn't matter what the boundary conditions are. It's, it's, it's always unbounded below. So, so first of all, uh, take any Q satisfying the boundary data and multiply it by some smooth function, which is 1 near the boundary. So that means that whatever the boundary conditions are, it's still going to be satisfied. Because uh, the same as, same as Q in the, in the neighborhood of the boundary. And 0 in some ball B compactly supported in omega, which, which we'll take to be the unit, the unit ball. And so we're going to alter uh, Q in B uh, only so it is, and show that it's unbounded below subject to Q on the boundary being zero. Because uh, um, we know that, uh, that, that this Q phi is uh, zero on the, on the boundary of B. So you choose a particular Q, and this is the one we chose. So a function of the radius times uh, x over norm x tensor x over norm x minus so the identity with h of 1 is 0 so that you're matching the boundary data on the boundary of the ball and then you you calculate everything so the gradient of q squared is, is this 2 thirds h prime squared plus 4 over r squared uh, h squared and the and the problematic term here turns out to be 4 ninths h into h prime squared minus 3 over r squared h squared so these are just calculations and so, therefore, uh, j of q, which is the, the integral in the, um, in the ball, well, it's less than or equal to, uh, I mean, the, the, the three terms in L1, L2, and L3 are bounded above by a constant times the gradient of q squared. So that's where this comes from using this expression. I've put the, um, the uh, bulk energy here. There's no dependence on angle or on the, on the point on the sphere. So I have a change of variables with an R squared. And then the, the L4 term gives you, gives you this. Right? And C is, a, C is a constant. Now, um, uh, provided H is bounded, then all the terms are bounded except these ones, the ones with R squared, H prime squared. So if we go back. So. Um, this is bounded if, 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 H is, if H is bounded, Q is bounded, so this is bounded. And, uh, and um, this term will be bounded because the R squareds cancel. And uh, this term will be uh, also bounded uh, for the same reason. I mean, for a fixed, for a fixed uh, as long as you fix the L4, it'll, it'll be bounded. So the, the, one, the terms you have to worry about are, are, um, are, are, are the the ones with, and let me just check what I said was correct there, as the, as the, the, well, the ones with h prime squared, all right? OK. So we have to show that that is unbounded below, and you, cho you choose a particular h of r. 
So um, it's this. It's this if r is between half and one, so you see it's zero on the boundary as you you need. And here it's it's got a term uh, sine k r, and there's a coefficient h zero at the front. And then the um, on 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 a half one, this is this is this is bounded provided h provided h zero is is bounded. So you have to just worry about um, this part. So that's four pi integral from zero to a half of r squared times this, and then you have to put the derivative, so that's h zero squared k squared cos squared kr. And so now you choose um, uh, L for h zero to be sufficiently negative so that this expression is negative. You fix such an L four and an h zero such that it's negative. So then the other terms are bounded, but this one with the, uh, there's a k squared there, that's going to go to, inf to infinity as k goes to infinity. We've got a negative sign here, so it shows that the, the energy is uh, um, unbounded below. So what are we going to do about that? So, um, so there's an analogy with uh, nonlinear elasticity. I might mention, so in nonlinear elasticity, you're given uh, the unknown is a map from some reference configuration to, to R3. The, the energy that you want to minimize is some integral of an energy density that depends on the spatial gradient. And you, and you want to minimize it subject to suitable boundary conditions, for example, that Y on some part of the boundary is, is prescribed. And then uh, you, to prevent inter interpenetration of matter, you require that y is invertible, right? and and in particular, uh, we want the um, the determinant of the gradient of y of x to be strictly positive, almost everywhere. So there, there we've we've got another, we've got um, a a pointwise const inequality constraint on the unknown. Actually, this is worse than for liquid crystals, because it's 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 a, the, the determinant of the gradient of y is a function of the top derivative in the energy, right? Whereas in the, in the landau degen theory, it's, a, it's an inequality on Q, but there are grad Q squared terms, right? So this is a, this is a more difficult problem, actually. And so what we, what we do is in, in, in nonlinear elasticity is to assume that the, that the energy blows up as the determinant goes to zero from above. And then, and then you'll know that any minimizer will have to satisfy this. I mean, the issue of global invertibility is a different story. I, I, I won't get into that. But then we would like to um, prove that the determinant was, in fact, bounded away from zero. Right? Now, if it's not bounded away from zero, then that means that the integrand is infinite somewhere. Of course, you, you, you're looking at a minimizer. It sounds funny that the integrand should be infinite somewhere if you're trying to minimize it. But we saw that that happened for the hedgehog, actually. The hedgehog is a, is a minimizer in the, of the ozone frank theory. But at the origin, it, it, uh, the energy blows up, right? So it can, I mean, so it's sort of a stupid thing to say, but I say it nevertheless. I mean, the thing is that, that if you make the integrand infinite somewhere, you can make it smaller somewhere else. Right? <laughs> and so overall, the energy can be less, right? So that's, uh, that's what happens for the, for the hedgehog, for example. So, uh, so this is a long-standing open problem to prove this. I've no idea how to do it in any situation at all. Two okay. D, the, the you know, the nicest sort of function satisfying this you can think of. No idea, and nobody has any idea as far as I can see. Now, but you see, if you don't, if you don't have this, then it's not obvious how you can you show that a minimizer satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation. Because um, you know the set where a minimizer has zero determinant could be could be dense actually, and so now you, you you'd like to um, I mean so if I just take sort of y plus epsilon phi the determinant is going to be negative uh, so probably so you, you I mean if you have this you have a chance of you know showing that minimizers satisfy the Euler Lagrange equation. And the normal, it's another open problem in elasticity to show that minimizers satisfy the normal form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, where you just take 
d by dt of i of y plus t phi uh, as t goes uh, at t equals zero. I'm sure that at zero. So nobody knows how to do that. There are other forms that you can you can prove. So uh, so here it's natural to suppose that um, that the bulk energy blows up as the minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third. Okay. And Ericsson, who did lots of fundamental work in liquid crystals, um, uh, made such a suggestion in the context of his model of pneumatic liquid crystals. Now, I've not mentioned his model, but um, he took as the variables n and s. So he assumed everything was uniaxial, but in his model he had an n and an s. So he, he would be supposing that that energy blew up as s goes to minus a half, for example. Okay. So with Apala Majumda, uh, uh, this is joint work with her, uh, we showed that uh, such a, a bulk energy can be constructed on the basis of a microscopic model and the interpretation being that perfectly aligned states have entropy minus infinity. And, and this will also allow us to get, if we use such a bulk energy, it will allow us to get existence of a minimizer when L4 is not zero. So it will sort out that particular problem. So this is done on the basis of the so-called Onsaga free energy function. So, so here's the free energy. So rho is, as before, the uh, molecular, the, 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 the probability distribution of orientations. However, I will, I will, I will allow um, uh, um, rho to be uh, non-symmetric, because later there are some other models where there really is a direction to the molecules. And so I, I, I will uh, at some point allow um, rho to be uh, not symmetric with respect to changing p to minus p. So, um, so what, what do we have? So there's rho. Tor is the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. And then here we have um, uh, a function k that depends on the dot product between p and q. So now, the interpretation of the first term is that it's minus the entropy. And the interpretation of the second term is that it's due to molecular interaction. So if you take, say, a, a molecule with orientation p and another one with orientation q, then we, um, we count k of p dot q times rho of p rho of q as, the, as the, is representing the interactions between those molecules. Okay, so um, now you might think that you could have something more general here, say a kernel which depended on p and q. But, but frame and difference of such a kernel uh, which is this, this condition, so k of r, p, r, q is k of p, q, actually implies that k has this form. So uh, that's, what we, that's why we assume that little k is, uh, is just a function of p dot q. Well, in the Maya-Saupe theory, the, the, um, the, the, the kernel k is given by this expression, k of p dot q is minus kappa p dot q squared. And kappa is a positive constant independent of the temperature. And if we calculate, um, uh, well, here's, here's, the, here's the, um, the q tensor corresponding to rho. This is just the definition of, of the q tensor. Let's, let's compute it's the square of its norm. Okay, so that's the double integral of, of, of this p tensor p minus a third the identity dotted with q tensor q minus a third the identity times rho of p, rho of q dp dq. And you see that, well, p tensor p dotted with q tensor q gives you p dot q squared. Uh, the identity dot the identity gives you three, so that times that gives you one third. And then p dot p tensor minus a third the identity gives you minus a third. And, um, um, and, and similarly for that term, so you get two-thirds minus one-third, and so you get minus one-third. And, um, okay, 
So uh, now, of course, the the integral of rho is is one. So this term just gives you a a, a constant actually. So hence the um, the the energy is the en entropy term minus kappa over two times uh, because because the ent because this is k. Uh, in fact, you can um, you can you can write the the term as kappa over two q of rho squared plus a constant. Right. So that's the important thing about the Myosalpy theory that the molecular interaction term depends on rho only through the Q-tensor of rho. Right? Whereas for other, for other um, kernels, that would not, be not, that would not be the case. OK, now let's, let's suppose we take a Q, which is in this set E, which is, you know, again, um, symmetric trace-free tensors with lambda min. Uh, maybe I can try and move that thing. I, I'm never very, I don't usually succeed in doing this. We'll try. Um, down there, maybe. Okay. So, so take a take a Q whose minimum eigenvalue is bigger than minus a third, and what we'll do is we'll we we'll, we'll define the bulk energy to be the the infimum of the. Um, of the uh, um, energy, you know, the entropy minus the, um, so I, I've dropped the constant term now, um, minus the, in the molecular interaction term, among rho whose Q tensor is that matrix Q. So you're given a Q, and then you minimize, you minimize um, over rho with Q of rho is equal to Q. And you see, since this term just depends on Q, so we only have to minimize, actually, the integral of rho log rho. So this was an idea also which was uh, proposed by, by these guys. Um, and uh, what's going on here? Interesting. Work okay. So now, um, so thus we. So this is just repeating what I said. We have to, given a Q, with minimum eigenvalue bigger than minus a third, we just have to minimize this entropy term or minus the entropy integral of rho log rho over the sphere among rows that are probability measures and whose Q tensor is the matrix Q. Right, so that's what we have to do. And so it, it, it attains a minimum at, at, a, at a unique rho sub Q in a Q. So we already showed that, um, that A sub Q was non-empty. That was this construction of the rho by an approximation of a singular measure. So we'll, we'll use the direct method again. We'll take a minimizing sequence uh, for E in the set of admissible functions. And now I, I have that the that of course rho is positive and the integral of rho log rho is, is bounded. Rho, the integral of rho j log rho j is bounded. And rho log rho is superlinear. And so you can use this de la Valle Poussin criterion for weak compactness in L1 to show that you can extract um, a, uh, a weakly convergent subsequence. Uh, to some rho sub q in L1 of the sphere. Okay, and rho of q is obviously going to be bigger equal to zero. And uh, because, because um, of the form of q of rho, it's just a function of, of p times rho, then we convert, which, which is a, a bounded function times rho, so you can clearly uh, pass to the limit using weak convergence in L1 to show that, in fact, the, the, the q tensor corresponding to rho sub q is also Q. And now, 
uh, you use the convexity of rho log rho to, 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 to show that uh, you have lower semi-continuity, and so rho sub q is a minimizer, and it's unique because rho log rho is strictly convex. So that's um, very straightforward. Uh, however, in fact, rho sub q can be given semi-explicitly as, as a Gaussian on the sphere. So here is uh, the theorem. So again, we take a q with minimum eigenvalue strictly bigger than minus a third, and we, um, and we uh, write it in its spectral decomposition. Then in that basis of eigenvectors, the unique minimizer is given by this expression. So it's, um, it's the exponential of mu1 p1 squared plus mu2 p2 squared plus mu3 p3 squared divided by the integral of that expression, which is the partition function. And the, and the mu i's are constants which have to satisfy this equation, right, where, where the, the gamma i are the eigenvalues of the second moment tensor not normalized, namely lambda i plus one third. And they're, and they're unique up to uh, an additive constant. So um, you see that it's, it's sort of semi-explicit because, because this involves the z, right? Uh, and so um, it's, uh, it's not, not a completely explicit um, function. OK. So now, how would you, how would you go about uh, doing this? Well, the natural, the natural thing to do is you know there's a minimizer. Why don't you calculate its Euler-Lagrange equation and find out what it is? Right, that would be the natural thing to do. However, that's a little bit tricky here because you've got a a pointwise inequality constraint that rho is bigger than or equal to zero, and so rho could be zero um, on some set of, of um, measure zero. Right. Um, well, you, you can you can do it that way, but but it's tricky. So you have to, you have to, um, you have to, sh to, to, to um, well, what you do is you, you, you vary rho sub q where it's bigger than some epsilon and less than, say, 1 over epsilon. And then you calculate the Euler-Lagrange equation on that set where you have no problem. And, uh, okay, so you, you, you play, play games like that. So that it is possible to do it. And, and you, you end up by showing that rho sub q is bounded away from the, that, um, the eigenvalue of, um, of, of um, that the minimum eigenvalue is bounded away from, um, uh, uh, sorry, that rho, rho sub q is bounded away from zero. That's the issue, that rho sub q is bounded away from zero. However, so, so that's what you could do. However, there's a quicker proof using a, a dual variational principle. Uh, and, and from that, the existence of a minimizer also follows. So um, I'm going to move this thing again. Maybe back, in, put it back up to the top. Um, OK. So um, you look at this, uh, sorry. You look at this uh, function h of v. V is a, just a vector. Gamma was the remember the um, the vector of the of lambda i plus one third. Uh, and you take gamma dot v minus the logarithm of z of v. And um, and what you show is that uh, that this attains a maximum over v. And if mu is the maximizer, then rho q has this I indicated form. And it indeed is, um, it, it, uh, um, and, the, and, the, and the minimum of E is the maximum of H. Right? So that's a minimax principle. So how do you prove that uh, this guy uh, attains a maximum? Well. Uh, so first of all, you note that if m is 1, 1, 1, then, and I look at h of v plus tor m, 
then uh, well you get a you get a you get a tor here because the, the sum of the gamma i's is one, and here you you have to put in a tor tor here, um, where the sum of p i squared is one, and you and, and and when you work it out you see that that's uh, actually independent of tor. Okay, so um, because you have you have a log of the exponential of tor, which is tor, and it cancels with the tor, right? So h is is invariant uh, in this direction, one one one. So it's sufficient to consider h for v in m perp, which is the the set of v such that v dot m is zero. Okay, and um, and then you show that h of n is a strictly convex concave function on this set. And it goes to minus infinity as you go to infinity. So strictly concave, it goes to minus infinity. So it, 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 um, it uh, attains a, a maximum. And that has to be unique, because it's strictly, strictly concave. Uh, move this thing again. There's some way to get rid of it completely, but I've forgotten how. Somebody showed me once. That should disappear of its own accord, but it hasn't, you see. Okay, move this down some more. No. Well, I, I kill it, yes. I kill it. Brilliant. Okay, very good. Okay, so um so first of all you you, you there's a straightforward calculation that shows that the logarithm of Z of V is a strictly convex function of V. So I've got minus the logarithm in the, in, the in the formula for h of v. So h of v is, and the other term is linear. So h of v is strictly concave. Now to prove that it goes to minus infinity as v goes to infinity, uh, it's enough to show that um, the exponential of minus h of v goes to plus infinity. So, and this is the expression. And so what you, what you do is you, you, just, you just look at the... Um, Happened before when I moved the moved the thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's something to do with moving that. Uh, um, what does that happen? Um, escape. Doesn't even allow me to escape. How do I do that? Um, there we go. No idea. All right. So, um, so that you look at the uh, you look at the integrand, and you and you and you and you find that it's uh, it, it can be written in this form. Where I've used the fact that p one squared plus p two squared plus p three squared is one on the sphere, and then you look at the at the sets of p where where these um, expressions in brackets are positive and negative, and you and you see that you can uh, that you can make this go to um, uh, infinity. Okay. Uh, right now, now given a, a given a maximizer mu of h, you of course you have that its derivative at the maximizer is zero, and that uh, turns out to be exactly this equation which we had before in the, in the theorem, and that expresses the fact that, that the Q tensor corresponding to rho sub Q is indeed Q. Okay. And, um, and now, now, now if you take an arbitrary rho, which is not equal to rho Q, then you use the strict convexity uh, of, of rho log rho to show that uh, E of rho is, is strictly bigger than I, so I use this is bigger than rho log rho, and then you take the derivative of this and you, and you um, multiply it um, that's the, uh, uh, like this. And then you, then you, then you, then you check that, um, the, because the integral of, because, um, um, because the integral of rho is equal to the integral of q, so that these two terms vanish. And this term vanishes because, the, the, because of this expression, that the, the, the q tensor corresponding to, to rho is, is is the same as well. It, it, it's because it's because we're minimizing among rows whose whose uh, whose um, q tensor uh, are, is equal to q. 
and so that's what you get from here, this being zero, and that's equal to E of rho Q, and then the calculation shows that it is, in fact, uh, H of mu. So that means that rho sub Q is the unique uh, global minimizer. Rho, rho sub Q given by this formula is the unique global minimizer. Okay, so now we could put that back into the to the um, um, formula for the bulk energy. So that's k sub bit k b theta times f of q, which is e of rho q, which is this in femum, and then we have minus kappa over two q squared, which is the other term. And equivalently, you can you can write it in terms of the the eigenvalues of q. Um, in this in this uh, form, uh, using the the formulae in the in the theorem, uh, and now um, now you note that um, that f of q, which is e of rho q, so the minimum value of of integral of rho, uh, the, the minimum value of, of e uh, for um, uh, um, among among rho. That, that that's a strictly convex function of Q, and it blows up as the minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third. That's why we call this the singular bulk potential. Okay. So uh, and that's what we wanted to do. I mean, of course, this 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 term remains bounded as as uh, because Q is bounded. It's in fact, mod Q. If the lamb if lambda min of Q is bigger than minus a third, then we know that the norm of Q squared is less than two thirds. That's what we, we, should, we show that. So that, that term will be bounded, so that can't do any damage to you. So why, why is that true? Well, the strict convexity of F follows from that of rho log rho. And now you suppose that um, you have a QJ for contradiction, that uh, uh, you have a sequence QJ for which F of QJ remains bounded, but the minimum eigenvalue tends to to minus a third. And then you take the corresponding eigenvector so that you know that um, this is going to minus a third, right? And, uh, but this is equal to, to this, this expression. Uh, Ej is the eigenvector corresponding to, um, to, um, to, the, uh, to, to the minimum eigenvalue. And so, you, you can suppose, again, that uh, since f of Q, qj is bounded, that you have weak convergence in L1. And you can also suppose that E of j, they're just unit vectors, converge to some unit vector. So here we've got um, uh, uh, an integral. This is going weakly, and this is going uniformly to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to p dot e squared. And so you can pass to the limit. You get this. But that means the row has to be 0 except when p dot e is 0. And, uh, and that's not possible because, th because that's a great circle, and then the integral of rho wouldn't be, wouldn't be 1. Okay, so, so this bulk potential does have this uh, property. And in fact, it, you, can, you, can, you can be more precise about how it blows up. So these are estimates on, on how... Um, uh, um, it blows up. So, um, so uh, if gamma min is lambda min plus a third, then then you you, you find that the blow up is uh, logarithmic, and, and you can do the, the the blow up of the of the gradient as well. Excuse me for sitting down. I got a bit of deli belly. Uh, um, now, so the and and to prove this, we use our um, construction of. Um, of, of a row to get the upper bound, and then the dual variational principle to get the the lower bound. Um, so how are we doing for time? Okay, okay. So there are other predictions and developments um, here. Um, so first of all, you can look at the stationary points of the um, Onsaga functional. So again, you have to be a little bit careful because rho is. Um, Rho is has this constraint that rho is big equal to zero, so there's later I'll I'll, I'll show you a precise definition of the um, um, of of what you mean by a stationary point. But anyway, the stationary points are uniaxial, and a phase transition is predicted 
from the isotropic to uniaxial pneumatic phase, just as in the, the quartic model. Now the minimizers of I of rho, rho star, correspond to the minimizers of the bulk energy over Q. Right? So that's, that's very, very natural. And now we get existence when L4 is not zero under suitable inequalities on the Li because you see the um, shoot, what do I do there? Uh, because the um, you see this is of the form this is the this is the term the, the cubic term right and it's of the form QLK um, let's say ALAK so you know that this is bigger equal to in fact minus one third times uh, the gradient of q squared, and it's less than or equal to 2 thirds times the gradient of q squared. So that means that you can control this term in terms of the gradient of q squared. And so if you put the right inequalities on L1, L2, and L3, uh, then, um, then, you, then, you, then you get existence. Uh, and near q equals 0, um, you can expand you can expand the energy, right? And here's a, you know, what you get, right? And now, if you think that the quartic model is, um, corresponds to Qs that are small, if you like, then the, these two coefficients uh, will be the ones with the B and the C. Okay? So if you, if you calculate that, then you see that, well, first of all, um, the expansion uh, gives that the coefficients should be proportional to theta because I've got one over theta k, kb here. And secondly, if you if you calculate what it is, it turns out to be 14 over 17, which is about 0.82. And the experimental values reported in the literature for MBBA is 1.19, which is not too bad. And for phi CB, it's 0.82, which is a bit surprising. Too good to be true, actually. Uh, now. Uh, my student, former student Jamie Taylor, uh, has generalized this construction of the singular potential to a broad class of moment problems. So we were dealing with second moments, but you can, you have func convex functionals which you minimize subject to, to fixed values of moments, and the whole, and the whole theory uh, goes through and gives various, various applications. And this, this um, singular potential. Uh, has been used in dynamic models. So I've, I haven't and won't talk about dynamics in this, in this course, but you can, you know, if you write down the dynamic equations, of course it contains the bulk energy and you, um, and you, uh, uh, and you can put for the bulk energy the singular potential. And so in these two papers um, uh, that was uh, done. And um, now, 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 now given, given appropriate boundary conditions, you can ask this question that we asked in, 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 in elasticity, uh, that uh, whether the minimizers of the bulk plus elastic energy have eigenvalues which are bounded away from minus a third. So there's a sum, in other words, there's some positive epsilon um, uh, such that uh, lambda min is bigger than minus a third plus epsilon, that, that will imply that lambda max is less than equal to a similar, similar thing. So, um, so the, that's the question, whether, whether the minimum eigenvalues are bounded away from minus a third. And, uh, well, we managed to prove that in the one constant case. So in the one constant case, um, uh, with sufficiently smooth boundary uh, boundary data uh, with uh, the minimum eigenvalue bigger than minus a third, then uh, in fact um, the minimum eigenvalue of, of um, any, any, any minimizer is, is, has, is bounded away from minus a third. And, and Q is a smooth solution of the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equation. And, and, and the way, um, the way one, one does it, so there, you see that there are, well, it's to, it's to Im imagine that you have a Q for which F of Q is unbounded, right? Then, then project it onto this set where F of Q is less than equal to some finite M. Uh, and, then, and then you can show that that, that will reduce 
both terms here. It will reduce the bulk energy because the bulk energy is blowing up as the minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third. But it also reduces this energy. And so, and so that gives you a, a contradiction and shows that, in fact, that uh, um, uh, you, you, you have this result. So there's been quite a bit of work. Uh, um, so it's, it's, it's an open problem to prove this uh, in the general case of three or more elastic constants. And this method does not work. Um, and there's, there's, there's partial results in 2D uh, by Bauman and Phillips. And there's a related partial regularity result in 3D of Craig Evans, Noose, and Hung Tran. And then there's a, there's a more recent paper by uh, Geng and Tong, who considered the three-dimensional case where, 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 where you, you add a little, or potentially a little, or maybe a big uh, multiple of div q squared to the, uh, to the energy for suitable uh, coefficients a. But they are, and, 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 and singular potentials, so they consider singular potentials that blow up as the minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third, and that they are convex. So that's uh, not a very good assumption because um, our singular potential is, is only going to be convex probably for very large temperatures, right? Because it's, it's a convex function minus a multiple of q squared. So uh, anyway, but it's uh, it's an interesting uh, an interesting paper, and I think that is where I'll stop. And, and next time I will go back to this to this form and um, and talk about uh, the critical points of this and uh, and, uh, and 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 axisymmetry. Okay, and the next one is Wednesday, the usual time, four fifteen, right? Yeah, four fifteen. Yeah. Questions? Okay, so we'll meet on Wednesday. We'll meet on Wednesday. Yes. Okay, thank you very much.